thank you for coming. Shall we start? Then, all right. So, uh, so I'm going to talk on um, a few works. I mean, he, he was actually saying it's uh, summarizing for years of work I've done with many people in different places. So, people in Lisbon like me, but uh, people in London and in Sheffield. Thank you. Okay, so, um, and uh, I'm considering here dark couplings uh, for several reasons, naturally. Because as cosmologists, we use scalar fields all the time for inflation and for dark energy. And uh, not only one scalar field, sometimes we do more than one scalar field. And, uh, and I'm sorry if your name is not in this slide. I mean, I'm just outlining a brief summarizing review of the research has been done on these uh, couplings. And uh, so several scalar fields have been considered, of course, but scalar fields, in principle, couple with the rest of the world. And uh, we've done this, or we've seen this in, in many aspects, in many contexts. Coupling with baryons, of course, this is uh, dangerous, and that's why we consider chameleons, simetron, etc., and uh, neutrinos, which also potentially dangerous, but it's more relaxed than coupling with baryons. And uh, we consider couplings with dark matter, and we build these models of coupled quintessence. And here, what I'm going to discuss is uh, this, uh, uh, besides the, cop the conformal couplings, so these formal couplings uh, that I've worked with uh, Carson, for example, and other people here. All right, so there are advantages and disadvantages of doing this, these couplings. Uh, of course, we can obtain scalar accelerating solutions. And, uh, and there's applications for, for example, uh, growing neutrino dark energy. The downside is that uh, in, uh, in case of the coupled quintessence, the dark matter never dominates the evolution of the universe. Okay, the couplings are very strong. The dark matter is always subdominant. And this you know, potentially uh, clearly brings problems with CMB and, uh, and growth of structure. Uh, of course, uh, the growth of structure because there are instability problem, problems, and some people have already talked about this in previous uh, presentations. Um, so, more recently, um, Brookfield and Karsten and um, other people like Baldi and, and collaborators have considered uh, the coupling of a scalar field not just to one dark matter component, but two dark matter components. I mean, there is no reason for us to believe that dark matter is only one particle. Okay, so we're going to discuss this a little bit in more detail, starting with conformal couplings. Everybody knows what it is. So we, we, there's a metric uh, where particles propagate and uh, is related to the gravitational metric by this conformal function. And uh, the equations of motion are written in the usual way, but with this coupling here, which is written in terms of, um, uh, okay, here in terms of um, the ratio between a logarithmic, uh, ratio of the coupling, the conformal coupling, uh, multiplied by the stress energy tensor, um, the trace of the stress energy tensor. And, uh, and this is uh, the conservation of the other fluids. All right, in FRW, or in FL, as the French would say, I suppose. Right. Then, uh, then these are the equations of motion, and the equation of motion for the fluids, and this one from this coupling, we can immediately integrate this. And that's, that's the easiest thing to do. And of course, these equations uh, that you need to use. We can rewrite all of these in terms of a system of first order differential equations. I'm sure most of you have seen this before. So mm -hmm. the only thing that doesn't matter, don't, doesn't matter. The, don't worry about the equations. What is important is, are these uh, functions here, these variables here? So x is the kinetic energy, y are the potential terms. So here, first, I'm considering uh, a sum of exponential terms for different, so I'm considering different fields and, uh, and different dark matter components, OK? So we find several critical points here. It is very technical now, but I'm going to go fast on this. And uh, so the first critical point you can find is the scalar field dominated solution. X is this, so the kinetic component is, yes, this looks like this. It looks very similar to what happens with one, one dark matter component, one single field. But, uh, but there's an effective 
slope of the potential, logarithmic <coughs> slope of the potential. And the important thing to notice here is that if you have many, many fields, then lambda is smaller. It's easier to achieve inflation. Okay, so this is something that has been studied ages ago and goes by the name of assisted inflation or multi-field inflation. And then there's a scaling solution. We write the x in the same way we'd write for a coupled quintessence with a single field. And, um, and then the equ effective equation of state is written like this with an effective coupling, an effective lambda, and lambda has this form as well. This is, for example, of two fields times two dark matter components. Right, so this is an example of evolution. We have the, the two fields, and here you can separate the energy of the two fields and the energy of the two dark matter components, and this is the scaling regime here, okay? And, um, and now this is the case where there's an exponential. The potential is an exponential of a sum of different components of the fields, okay? So here you cannot split the energy density components for the fields, right? So these are the equations of motion. And uh, there's a scalar field dominated solution. Now it's written like this. So now if you have more fields, lambda is going to be larger. Okay, so it's more difficult to achieve inflation. And uh, for a scaling solution, what do we do here? In an example of two fields and two dark matter components, we rotate in field space. We make a rotation in field space, and then it's easier to find the critical points in this way. All right. And then doing this, uh, it's a bit confusing, but you can also write the effective equation of state in terms of an effective coupling and an effective lambda, and they are written like this. Okay, this is an example for the two field, two dark matter case. If, if you have more fields, more dark matter components, then it's, it's going to be, of course, a lot more complicated. All right, then this is the evolution. As I said before, you cannot split the energy density of the two components now because there's only one potential term with such an exponential of a sum, a sum, and then this is the scaling, scalar field, uh, scaling solution, excuse me. All right, so this is, the scaling solutions are interesting. They were very interesting when they were proposed because they get rid of the initial conditions problem. Unfortunately, the couplings are very large and this will bring problems for the, the growth of perturbations as we see in a moment. But only from, from the mathematical aspect, I think it's interesting to look at the case where we have several fields and they are a copy of a single field. Yeah, they are all, they are several there, but they are essentially the same. Okay, and um, so if you do this, we can see what is the difference between this potential and this in terms of the, the abundance of the field and the W effective. Okay, so the, the, this is the abundance and this is the W effective. So in this case, with some of terms, the it's, it's very mildly dependent of the number of fields. Okay, these two quantities are very independent of the number of fields, whereas in the other case they don't. Okay, if you have a larger larger number of fields, then it's more difficult to get inflation. Remember, and uh, and the equation of state parameter is is larger. All right, and then there are solutions that do not depend on the potential. So these are general. And one is the kinetic dominated solution. Well, obviously, it's a stiff fluid. Omega phi is one. And then the conformal kinetic is this one. So it only depends on the conformal factor. And, uh, and the effective depends on this uh, quantity here. Then the matter dominated solution, it's, um, it's the case. Uh, I'll, I'll write it here so it's easier. It's the case where we have two dark matter components, but they have opposite signs of the couplings, okay? So essentially, we, uh, you build a, an effective potential like this, and uh, see, fine. Essentially, that's what you're doing, okay? So if you're building an effective potential and the field is here at the minimum, okay? So this is, this is the idea of these, these papers of uh, Carson with Brookfield and uh, Marco Baldi, and they have been studying these cases, and here we generalize, okay? You generalize for several fields and several dark matter components, so basically what you're doing is, is building a, an effective valley here. Okay, hope you understand. So the field you can roll in the minimum of this valley. Okay, and uh, so the, uh, the energy density of the dark matter component decays as one over a cubed. So this valley is coming down, and when the potential becomes important, that leads to an accelerated universe, okay, dominated by the potential. Right, so that's the idea behind it. So we are generalizing this model of Marco Baldi and, and friends. 
Right, so this is how it looks in terms of energy densities. So the field stabilizes in the valley, and then when the potential becomes important, it dominates the energy density of the universe. Okay, so um, you can look at the matter density contrast evolution, and the, poten the, uh, the potential problem is here. Yeah? So if the couplings are large, then the history is force is larger than gra gravity. Okay, so these couplings must be small. Now, we can look at this in the, uh, and this is what I've done here in the Newtonian limit, but if you look at, um, it doesn't matter now, but if you look at, um, uh, solve the, the, evolution, the evolution equations for different modes, yeah, we get these plots for the quantity f of g, if people have talked about this earlier in this, in this conference, and uh, we can get this data from redshift space distortions, and you compare different models, uh, this different lines mean different, different couplings with different signs. We have, we have uh, several combinations of these couplings and, uh, and we see that they can pass the present constraints and in the future, the error bars from SKA and Euclid can be sufficiently small to separate these from uh, lambda CDM, okay? So that's the idea behind this plot here. It's just an example, this comes from the paper with the people in London, Alex Lates and Karim Malik and David Murain. All right, so very quickly, uh, scalar field dominated solutions is easy to obtain uh, for uh, a sum of exponentials. Scaling solutions, they have effective couplings that are very large, and then they lead to problems with them. Um, the actually, it's something else. I'm talking about something else here. This is this figure we show that. Uh, uh, that uh, the case where we have one exponential with a sum of terms, we have a, s a strong dependence on the number of fields. Um, matter dominated epoch, the couplings must obey relation, relation for early dust behavior. Field settles at the bottom of the effective potential, which is the flat direction. So this is what I'm talking about here, in the case where we have the transient matter dominated uh, solution. And um, the matter density contrast depends on the size of the C couplings. Then if they are very large, they lead to instabilities. We know this. But it's possible to discriminate models in principle with the uh, SKA and Euclid. Okay, so this finishes the first part on conformal couplings. I'm not going to talk about when we add these formal couplings. So we've seen this before in this conference as well. We had this dependence on the derivatives of the field. And uh, the equation of motion is a lot more complicated now. So we add all of these terms here. And for FRW, these couplings here can be written in terms of background quantities in this way. Okay, these, these A's and, and B's and C's, they, sorry, A's and B's, that's all we need, depend on background quantities and the C's and the D functions. All right, again, here we look at the dynamical system analysis. We only have one fluid, but we might have one or two fluid components. One field, one or two fluid components. And uh, for the single fluid, that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, this is the, it's not so important now. It's for, uh, this is the other quantities that are, okay, that are important are the, the equation of state parameter, and there's this Z, which, is, uh, which comes about in when we define the, the equation of state parameter in, in, in this reference frame compared to the other reference frame. So. If you imagine, imagine if you have radiation where W is one third, one third in the reference frame, in the reference frame of matter, we W is not one third anymore. It depends on this formal coupling. Okay. So it's something I think uh, Carsten is going to talk about this because it has effects on CMB, right? And uh, just one potential problem here is when this Z, this quantity here, is zero. So when this becomes one, this is zero. And this leads to um, potential pathology, okay? Because that, is, that is, this ratio between the matrix becomes singular. And this was uh, discussed in, in Sachs' time paper some time ago. But we'll see that this is, in fact, not a problem because we'll never reach this critical point when this happens, okay? When Z is actually zero. Right, so we have uh, several critical points here as well. For a single fluid, we have the kination. This formal coupling is in then, uh, oh, I don't expect you to remember all of these, okay? So we have a disformal coupling when there's a beta here, okay? Because when we have a disformal function, 
there's an alpha and a beta, as we define it here. These are the, the functions that close the dynamical system. And when you, conform, when you have a conformal coupling, we have an alpha. Okay, so whenever you have a critical point with a beta means that there's a disformal component in there. Okay, so uh, the we have we have, we have seen this all these critical points except the deformal ones, of obviously. There's the mix one, which is a new one as well because it has a conformal and a disformal component, or the dependence, I'll say. Uh, conformal kinetic we already seen, just a generalization for a, a, ge a generic fluid. Scale fluid dominated solution we have seen, and the conformal scaling we have seen as well before. And this is a table summar summarizing all the points for a single fluid. Yeah. So here, obviously, I'm not showing what x and y are. These are the dependencies, dependence on the parameters of x. Yeah, it depends on gamma, alpha, and beta. It means that it's a mixed in this case. Here, it only depends on alpha. It's a conformal kinetic in this case because y is 0. And for example, this only depends on beta, so it's the total disformal critical point. OK, so that's what's behind this. It's very technical. I know we are coming somewhere soon. Um, and this is the case where you have two fluids, dust and radiation. Okay, so uh, again we have we define C's and D's, the conformal disformal couplings in this way. We now the I depending on radiation or matter, and the fixed points that existed before for the single fluid are still there, but they are t uh, there's there's two more here. I think it's two more here. So that's the conformal dust radiation, which means that, that dust is still there, radiation is still there. So these, these quantities are non-zero. But uh, the x only, uh, all of them only depend on alpha, which means conformal. So that's why you can call it conformal dust radiation. That's the B as well. And it is formal dust radiation. So dust is there, radiation is there, and there's a dependence on betas only. Okay. All right, so this is an example of an evolution, and we compare the cases where we have only conformal coupling and conformal and disformal couplings. Okay, so the conformal and disformal is the solid line, and the other one is the dashed line. Okay, so what do we see here? So uh, we see that um, in the radiation dominated epoch, for the only conformal, omega, omega is, is unity, for radiation is unity. Okay, when we introduce the disformal coupling, then this fixed point changes or might change or might lead to or, or might come close, the evolution might come close to other critical points, the disformal critical points, okay? Because radiation does not couple conformally, okay? So this uh, must be a disformal coupling, okay? So and these are the transient disformal fixed points and we, we can enumerate them and they are transient. Because they are transient, this, this, this problem that I mentioned before, z equals 0, does not apply. Okay, we never reach this point. And, uh, and uh, the, phenomenology, the phenomenology is that uh, <coughs> omega radiation is slightly below 1. Okay, you can, you can notice that the fixed point is not the previous one because omega r is not 1 anymore. The other thing that you notice is that the matter equality changes slightly. Okay, and uh, Whereas in the conformal coupling, we have a transfer of matter to the scalar field. Here you can see that there's a transfer of the scalar field to matter. Okay, so matter comes down and the scalar field goes up. Uh, sorry, the other way around. The scalar field comes down and the matter goes up a little bit. And then we reach the, the um, scalar field dominated solution. Okay, so and if again, there's the conformal disformal dust fluid. So this is the, this case essentially the case I mentioned here before. We are in this effective potential defined by the, by the couplings and not the potential, okay? So uh, I'm going to use these, well, I'm going to use a part of these, these results, to see what happens to the variation of alpha, the fine structure constant. And I'll, I'll explain this in a second. So in this case, we have, again, the, the, uh, these formal couplings, matter and radiation couple differently with these CRs and CMs, the Rs and the M. You can write the, the metric for radiation in terms of the matter for the, the metric for matter. And, uh, and you come to the electromagnetic setter and see this action here, okay? So this is how we'd write it in this reference frame of the, of the photons. <laughs> so this, uh, this is the F mu, F mu term, but now it's written in terms of the G tilde metrics, okay? And then you explain these, in writing these in terms of the reference frame of matter, 
this is this term here becomes like this and here we have included also this H which means a, a, a direct coupling between the field uh, or explicit coupling between the field and the electromagnetic center okay now you might assume that all of these oh sorry only these will give you alpha okay the alpha essentially is the inverse of the prefactor of f mu square okay but in fact this term here also contributes to alpha so the alpha is not going to be z or one of a z is going to be something else okay when you do the calculations so you look at uh, the uh, potential for electric potential for a, a charged particle then we see that this quantity here z over h is alpha uh, that's right z over h is alpha it's not, not the other way around okay it's not one of a z okay so this is important and now we can compare this with observations and with um, uh, experiments uh, at the lab current constraints so from alpha dot over alpha from atomic clocks and delta alpha over alpha from cosmological observations also Oklo and meteorites okay so this is how it relates to the explicit coupling and this z function here okay if, if z z is, is written in FRW is written like this and this is interesting because if dr is equal to dm and cr is equal to cm so if the photons and matter couple the same way then this z is unity so there is no no variation of alpha coming from the disformal couplings okay only if there's a different way of coupling matter and radiation okay so comparing this with observations uh, okay so the equations of motion uh, so we're defining oh, we've seen this before we define the c's and the d's the same way and h the explicit coupling with the electromagnetic field we we take we took a uh, taylor expansion so it's a linear a linear term here which is, which is this zeta it's defined by this zeta parameter here okay all right so what we found now we're plotting the evolution possible evolutions with different parameters for c and d against the data or you can say data constraints on variation of alpha cosmologically right so what you see here is that in order to have this field being dark energy then the the, um, the scales of these couplings c and d have to be around mev okay and the other thing is that uh, this is for this is for no con no conformal there's no conformal coupling here so this is zero now we have the case where zeta is zero which is the solid line here and have cases where zeta is non-zero so there's an explicit coupling with electromagnetism so even if zeta is zero there is no explicit coupling with electromagnetism but these formal couplings lead to a variation in alpha okay so that's the first conclusion here of course if we include the explicit coupling with electromagnetism this h function then this is increased and that's what you see in the other lines here okay and the other case here the other figure here we show is that we have a conformal coupling now okay if you increase the conformal coupling and even if you have, don't have an explicit coupling with electromagnetism then then this variation alpha is enhanced okay so essentially that's it um, so variation in fine structure constant can be induced by these formal couplings provided that the radiation matter these formal couplings strengths are not identical okay so we see c's and the d's are equal for matter and, and photons then then there are no there is no variation in alpha such a variation is announced in the presence of the usual electromagnetic coupling and, uh, and we expect from laboratory measurements and further constraints cosmologically will, will lead to constraints on these formal couplings from, from variation alpha. Okay. I think that, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. So so when you say matter, you just mean the dark matter, right? So you're not yes. so essentially you're well, so what you call G mu nu, the normal metric is the baryons, and then radiation is not moving in the same metric as the baryons, essentially. But then cosmological observations are done with light, right? So In, in, okay, in the second case, yes, yes, sure. Um, sure. Uh, but then there are, 
Okay, I, I, thought those, I thought there were quite strong particle physics constraints on <coughs> couplings of baryons in so some extra degree of freedom like that. And then, on, and then there's a second thing, which is that if you think about cosmological observations, I mean, the Hubble parameter, it's, the, it's essentially determined by light. So it's really the expansion of the metric which, in which light propagates on geodesics. So here you've moved light to a different metric, and therefore you should really be investigating a different Hubble parameter in which you may or may not have acceleration. I don't know. It's, uh, mm, it, it's, what is it? I mean, you have to, I mean, do you understand what I mean? That, that photons are no longer moving on geodesics of the matter metric. And therefore, when you try to measure h of z, you are measuring the h of z, the redshift of photons, i.e. The, the redshift of the, of the photon metric and not of the matter metric. And we have to take into account that the redshift is correct. So the redshift is also just one over one plus one, uh, a scale factor. So there's no trivial relation between the scale factor and z, so that also takes into account. Mm -hmm. So we work in the Einstein frame, but we did the mapping intuitively to this what's called the Jordan frame. But the Jordan frame is what? Is the photon frame or the baryon frame? It's the baryon frame. But the photon frame is different. And H of Z, you measure the photon. Fo I mean, right. Okay. okay, let's just go see this way. Thanks. In a similar context, that's to understand the model. So you start from the Jordan frame, and then you perform the transformation, and you get an effective coupling due to the transformation, right? Uh, so this is the way that you are obtaining the coupling. Well, we start in an Einstein frame with assuming this coupling. So and you can write uh, then the, the, the coupling in the equation of motion with respect to the metric, the gravitational metric. And then the conservation, I mean, this nabla is the initial one or the tilde one? The nabla? The, I mean, when, you're, uh, when you want to, to find the conservation equation and you yes. use the covariant derivative, this is... This is uh, expressed in terms of the initial metric that's, of the... That's, the, uh, that's without the tilde. That's already without the tilde. Okay. So then my question is the following. If you have mixed Lagrangian, how do you define the energy momentum tensors? So how do you define this team new new of phi and the rest? Uh, it's, it's fairly easy, actually. I can show you this later on. But, uh, I mean, if you have a coupling in the Lagrangian, so... For example, if you have two scalar fields, phi and chi, canonical scalar fields, and you have a mixed term, phi square, chi square, ah, but it's and you don't know how to interpret this term. I mean, so how do you define the energy momentum tensors? Um, I mean, with, with these formal couplings, we did not use two fields. Yeah, yeah I mean, Only formal couplings. between matter and, uh, and this phi field. So you have couplings in the Lagrange, and you, okay, we can talk on this uh, in the details later. So, so, but your energy momentum tensor can be uniquely defined, right? Yes, no, no, that's no problem. Because there's a relation between, uh, there's a differentiation between G tilde and G. And this, this can be easily extracted from the way we define the, this formal coupling. Well, I have a simple technical question. So if you couple uh, this formally, uh, your some perfect fluid, for example, those fluids which we saw by, by Luigi, uh, or maybe some other, you know, let's take Schutz action, right? Then the key point is that the fl this dark, e dark energy or dark matter fluids, they are kinetically driven, right? So if you plug it in the first derivatives of the other field, then uh, actually the causality or how these things will propagate will not be given even by the metric which you provide. Have you checked that? It's um, essentially... Uh, it's not, it's not the same question because technically it's not the same. If you just plug it in into your Lagrangian, this metric, for example, if I take Schutz Lagrangian for, uh, let's say, I don't know, some perfect fluid, right? But now instead of the metric, I write the, the disformal metric. Then actually because it's, a, it's now my system is derivatively coupled, I will get second derivatives of both fields in both equations. So theoretically, in order to find out what is my real metric, where the things propagate, I would need to write characteristics of the stuff, basically write determinant, or make triangularization of this metric. And the resulting metric where the things propagate will not, will not have to anything, at least naively, anything to do with what you plug in. I think you're right. It's a detail. We have to work it out. Okay. I think. Good. Uh, 
Or maybe it's okay in that case, I don't know. Okay, thank you.